So Steve sent me a message. He says that he'd love to have a go at wild camping. But he doesn't know where to start. He also followed on to say, you know, how did I get into it? How did I go about choosing the gear, finding places to camp, all that kind of thing really. And knowing what I know now, if I had to start from scratch, you know, would I do it th things differently? So yeah, this video, or this whole camp, I'm gonna to dedicate to answering all of those questions about how I got into it, how I chose my backpack, tents, the whole transition really, from beginner to amateur and all that in between. So I'll start off with, let's try and get some sort of definition of what wild camping is. So, here in the UK anyway, most people tend to think of wild camping as the pastime of camping, but not being on a campsite. So somewhere quite remote, without any facilities, no toilets, no running water, all that kind of thing really. Somewhere like this, so it'd be moorland, maybe woodland, hills, mountain tops. Although technically, you know, it's not really wild in the UK. Not when you compare it to like the Congo or, you know, Vancouver Island or whatever it is where they've got cougars running wild. Yeah, you know, it's, there's nothing really to worry about here. But for the sake of this video, that is how I'm going to describe wild camping anyway. So today I am literally a couple of mile away from the car. And there's some people that will say, no, it's not wild camping. You know, wild camping is for multi-day trips or, you know, somewhere, like say in the middle of nowhere. Um, if you're doing something like the, the West Highland Way, then you would have to wild camp in between stages, for example, like that. But wild camping's whatever you want it to be, in my opinion. It's whatever you want to get out of it. We all do it for very different reasons. So, you know, when it comes to multi-day trips, I do those as well. So I will still wild camp on those occasions. But other occasions, like today, I still want a wild camp as well. I'm using similar sort of equipment, although you know, when you are you know, walking 10, 20 miles a day for multiple days, I wouldn't be choosing a tent as heavy as this, but similar principle, I'm gonna have some sort of shelter some kind of sleeping bag, sleeping pad, food for the day or the trip. Yeah, you get the drift. So yeah, it's a different thing for different people. And wild camping for me is, is more about what, you know, what I get out of the, the experience. People do it for different things different reasons so for some it's a means to an end so like I said if you are doing a multi-day trip let's say you're doing the Pennine way and there's nowhere for you to stay along the way you may need to take your camping equipment with you and wild camp some or all of the sections whichever you choose some other people wild camping is about Getting an escape from the everyday grind. Um, a bit of a recharge of your batteries. You know, maybe just getting closer to nature again. You know, there's loads of different reasons why people do it. So I think it's wrong to, you know, to judge anybody else's experience of it. You know, just enjoy it for yourself. 
make of it whatever you want to make of it really. So I'd be interested to know, you know let me know in the comments what what your reasons are for wild camping if you do it anyway. Not everybody does. I do like a freestanding tent for this reason. Um, you can move it wherever you want to. Get the flattest bit of ground. So the hobby, pastime, whatever you want to call it, of wild camping, it's getting really, really popular now. Um, whenever you look on Instagram, Facebook, there's loads of different photos out there showing some of these wonderful locations where people have got tents pitched and it is really really you know tempting if you like the outdoors I can see why anybody would want to go and pitch the tent in one of these wonderful locations but different people you know want different things out of wild camping like I said so some people they want the challenge of pitching the tent in the most extreme weather conditions uh, they want to test you know, just to see how how good they are how you know how they can survive the night in you know some really harsh weather and I must admit in the past I've, I've done that myself more so now though I want to be able to have that little bit more comfort and luxury. I don't necessarily go out deliberately looking for you know, 50, 60 mile an hour winds. Although that's one thing I do like about this tent. <laughs> this one is up to the job. But for other people, it might be the social element. element. You know, they wanna go camping with friends or they want to go and see new places, new countries, maybe head up to Scotland or over to Wales or Snowdonia. So depending on the type of wild camping you want to do, you might need different equipment. So like I said, I think this tent weighs around three and a half kilos, but you know, when I was doing the, the Cumbria Way, which was 80 miles of hiking over five days, I would not have wanted to carry this. So I took a trekking pole tent, which was around 800 grams, I think it is, which is much more suitable for that style of camping. If you want to do all of these kind of things, if you want to do extreme winter camping, or you want to do multi-day camping in the summer, or you just want to do a bit of woodland camping, maybe in a hot tent, you'll probably need different equipment to do those different tasks anyway I'll get some stuff in the tent and then we'll talk about how I actually got into this thing in the first place So I sort of got into wild camping before I even knew what wild camping was. Uh, for me, it was, it was bushcraft. Um, I was into woodland craft, camping in woods. It was predominantly using a bivy bag or a hammock. I was never using a tent. And it was more about the learning the more primitive skills, um, appreciating you know, the resources that the, the land had to offer, so to speak. There's not so much on offer here today, as you can see. It's just barren moorland at the minute. It's not even a view. But in the woods, I was learning how to, to make things like pot hangers, um, chairs out of, out of wood, how to do bow drill fires, using some of the, the natural plants and flowers, edibles. So things like nettle tea, some of the flower petals that you could eat, tying knots, fire making, and appreciating you know, what a woodland environment had to offer throughout all of the seasons, really. So it's very different 
in the winter in a woodland than it is in the springtime. And although I was still camping and needed a shelter, the gear that I was using was very different to the stuff that I'm using now. It's a little bit better. So it's just started to rain a little bit. So yeah, whether you're in the woods or you're up on the moors or on the hills, you do need some sort of shelter to get you out of the elements. A hammer could be no good somewhere like this, would it? So I was actually out in the woods practicing the skills quite a bit before I did any camping. So, you know, I, I got a few little items such as, uh, I got a tarp, I got a, an army surplus, um, DPM pattern military basher, which is about six foot by nine foot, something like that. So I learned to, to tie knots, to set up tarp shelters, just to get me out of the rain really, um, where I would you know, practice a, a few fire lighting techniques using a little wood stove. So, you know, those kind of items are not ideal for, for this sort of camping scenario, especially the wood stove. Um, you know, it's a no-go really having a, a fire in these PT, peak district areas. So, you know, I've, I've had to transition over from, from some of those bits of gear to you know, the gear that I've got now. So a lot of the gear that I used for the woodland camping was like I said, military surplus. So I went to the army stores. I bought a British army self-inflating sleeping pad or mat that was only about that thick, three quarter length, not really comfortable, but it did a job. Um, I had the bouncing bomb sleeping bag, uh, Arctic bag, which was, it's huge. It would probably fill this backpack that I've got now. Um, yeah, the, I had a, a DPM, Army Bergen, which was about 100 litres, 80 to 100 litres, I can't remember exactly now. Um, but when you're in the woods, you know, you're not actually hiking that far, you would park the car, short hike into the woods, um, and you can use more heavy duty gear. Also, it needs to be tougher and more robust. So all of my early gear was based around, you know, woodland kind of camping. Even my me, me boots were, I think they were Hakes Army boots, Army issue which they <laughs> weighed a ton. Um, great for in the forest, but no good if you wanted to, for me anyway, if you wanted to stomp eight miles up a hill. Um, and then I was, I was doing my research. I was, you know, studying YouTube because there wasn't loads and loads of stuff on Instagram and stuff like that back then. It was, it was mainly YouTube. And this was long before I started filming actually. And whilst doing a little bit of the bushcraft research, I found, a YouTube channel called Dean Reed. Well, the fella's called Dean Reed. Um, he's a local lad to around here. Um, done a lot of his stuff in the Peak District, but he was doing some bushcraft stuff um, with Jay from Goonie Bushcraft. So these were some of the early YouTube channels. But Dean also did a lot of the, you know, the hiking and the, the wild camping in the hills. And I hadn't really seen any of that before him. I was mainly watching people like Wiltshire man, um, funky prepper, <laughs> you know, Paul Kirtley, MCQ bushcraft. It was more about learning those skills really. But yeah, I saw Dean and he was camping around, I think it was Mermaid's Pool away. And I thought, wow, that is, that is stunning. <laughs> I've got to go and check, check some of that out. So I went for a bit of a hike um, in me, in me army boots, um, and I actually fell in love with the view. So I hadn't really done much hill walking before then, just like the odd little you know, trip to Mam Tor and that with the school. But yeah, it was mainly just walks in the park that I did, not anything hilly or mountainous. And I thought, I've got to have a go at this myself. So I decided that I was going to go, you know, wild camping in a more hilly environment. So the actual first time, <laughs> believe it or not, Peak District Camp was in a hammock because I didn't have um, a tent at the time. Um, I thought about Vivian, but I went to a little woodland which was just up from, just down, sorry, from Kinder Scout. Set my hammock up 
Um, but the kit that I took, it was in, it was in my Bergen. So I've got like 100 litre pack with all heavy stuff, you know, stainless steel pots. Um, I actually took a little wood burner with me, but um, I took a Trangia um, alcohol burner with it. So I could put the, the alcohol burner inside the, the wood burner. So yeah, I thought I'd have the best of both worlds. I could have a little fire off the ground um, if it was possible, um, but I could always you know, boil my water up using the alcohol burner as well. But that trip was a massive, massive learning curve for me because the, the gear that I had for, you know, for that style of hiking and camping was just way too bulky, way too heavy and about broke me back anyway. So I knew a few things had to change. So I started to look into lighter weight options. Um, a tent, although the next few wild camps that I did uh, up in the Peak District were actual bivvy camps, bivvy and tarp. Um, so the first bivvy that I got was a, a snug pack stratosphere, I think. No, it wasn't. It was the British Army, British Army bivvy. Um, but I didn't, I liked the bivvy, but I didn't like the fact that it didn't have bug protection. So, you know, when I was sleeping at night, I was also having to wear a head net. So I didn't want anything crawling in me, me ears or up my nose. I'm a bit of a wuss like that. Oh, wow. Uh, I just want to show you that. <laughs> so when I got my sleeping pad inflator, it also sucks the air out. I bought some of these suction bag things as well and I would never have dreamt of using them for wild camping but that is a four season minus 12 down sleeping bag sucked down to nothing um, I'll show you how it works in the morning when I pack it all away so my early wild camps so my early wild camps was like a a mix of both you know British army surplus stuff you know, the the bush grass stuff that I had and I was gradually starting to bring you know, other bits of kit in, such as, like, say, Trangia. Um, I got uh, an Alp kit, um, Sky High 600 sleeping bag, because it, it just was a lot smaller than the British Army one. Um, I got a different sleeping pad, an Alp kit, Eros, I think it was. It's still a sleeping mat, self-inflating mat. But, you know, even now, after all this time, I still haven't got the the perfect sleeping pad for me. It's, there's always something that's not quite right, either comfort or warmth. I'm trying a new one again today. I've bought the Nemo Tensor. Um, although I'm not convinced on the warmth of this one from what uh, I've read. So I've bought the closed cell foam mat just to go underneath it if I need it. And give it a little bit of protection as well because it looks quite flimsy. But yeah, it was, it was quite a transition. So even when I started to get some of the, the ult, more ultralight kits. So I got a, a Van Gogh Nevis 200 tent, which is two kilos. Um, so I used that for a little bit. Um, yeah, I've been to places like you know, Penny Fan, I've camped the Brecon Beacons in that, um, Hallinfell, um, and a few around in the peaks as well, Bamford Edge. Um, and I also got a yeah, no into next level. Six Moons Design Skyscape Trekker. I think that's about a kilo trekking pole tent, the first one. Which was, was quite funky, but you know, it didn't really stay the course that. But even on when I was using that, I was using a a more bushcrafty backpack. It was a Caramore Sabre Special Forces. Um, I think it was the 40, 44 litre, 42, something like that. And so it, it was never quite the right setup. It was a it was like a pick and mix, really. So it was it was a strange one for me. If I had just gone straight away to this style of wild camping, I think I would have bought totally different gear. But you know, when you want to start wild camping, you've got to bear in mind quite a few different things. So there's you know, the, the type of camping that you're going to be doing, whether it's going to be multi-day, 15 mile 
camp, 15 mile camp, you're going to need something that's a little bit lighter. Um, but if you're going to be summit camping on really windy, exposed ledges and things like that, you're going to need something more robust, like maybe like this or a Hilleberg or one of the Terra Novas. But like I said, you wouldn't want to be carrying this for 15 mile a day. You might be on a budget and you've only got, you know, 50 or 100 pounds to spend on a tent. Um, so you know, that, that puts certain things out of your price range straight away. You might be the sort of person that can just sleep on one of these foam mats. I can't, I'm a side sleeper and it's just too uncomfortable. So I need something with a little bit of cushion into it, like uh, an air mattress. There's loads of different things to consider. So early on I was probably still doing more bushcraft than, you know, this kind of wild camping anyway. This was probably one of the first lightweight bits of kit that I got. So it's the Out Kit Mai Tai 650 mug. That didn't come with it. But. And there was a guy called Norman, Storming Norman. It was making these custom made uh, pot support slash um, windshield, you know, for whatever pot you'd got really. Yeah, the Storming Norman Cone. So these literally weigh, I don't know, a few grams. I don't know exactly, but it's under 50 grams for the complete kit. And then you just, you know, interleave these in. There we go. Then you've got like a, a cone windshield that your pot fits into. So we also supplied it with a little alcohol stove. So this one's just made with a tonic water thing. So I don't know how old this is now, but it made for an incredibly lightweight cook set. I'll show you it now, I may as well. Still one of my favorite stoves. You cannot buy these anymore, by the way. Um, Norman sadly passed away. Um, so you can buy something similar like the Trail Designs Sidewinder or something like that, or the Caldera Cone. So this is also really good because it, it's spill proof. So like a Trangia, so I can tip that over and there's no fuel coming out. But a Trangia, um, if you knock that over, you'd be in a whole world of pain. <laughs> Get some water on the go. We'll have a cup of soup, methinks. So that's another thing, when it comes to stoves and burners and things, depending on what kind of cooking you want to do, that can determine you know, what kind of stove you want and cook set. So if you just want to use boil in the bag meals or which is I've brought with me today, which you'll see in a bit. Yeah, let's have a look at this. Yeah, so that holds all of the heat inside the cone. It means it's really efficient. It's really windproof as well. Yeah, still one of my favorite bits of kit and it's one of my earliest bits of wild camping kit. You know, when it comes to you know, moorland, hill, mountain, wild camping anyway. So this is much cleaner and easier to use than the wood stoves that I was doing when I was bushcrafting. It's not very quick when it comes to boiling. It's not the best kind of stove, I don't think, for, for cooking. It's not very quick and it's really only for boiling water um, or simmering water. I've got this little <laughs> simmering bit butchered now though it's just a again just a bit of a pop can or something like that the joy of alcohol stoves you can actually make them yourself and they're really cheap cheap to buy cheap to run um yeah it's a great way of starting when it comes to to wild camping cook kits anyway alcohol stoves camping food it doesn't have to be complex it doesn't have to be bland either wait till you see what i've got for tea Soup for starters though, well, a snack. 
There we go, raging. Do need to be careful though, we don't want to burn ourselves, do we? Gonna put that flame out just by snuffing it. There we go. Job done. Croutons. You a crouton person? Just started to rain again. A bit hard at the minute that. So camping isn't actually that complicated. Hmm. You don't need that much gear to be honest with you. You need a few basics such as a shelter that's suitable for the conditions that you're going to be camping in. It's all about the views isn't it? You're also going to need um, something to keep you warm. So um, a sleeping bag and some kind of ground mat as well or sleeping pad to insulate you from the ground. And a backpack of some description to carry that lot in. That is pretty much the basics to what you need. Um, you probably, you want something to keep you warm, like a maybe a down jacket or an insulated coat. A waterproof of some description. You might, you might want some food and a little stove to cook your, to cook your dinner. But you can manage without that. You can just take a sandwich if you want to. The important thing is that all of your gear is suitable for the weather conditions and the temperatures as well. So. Sleeping bags and sleeping pads, they've got ratings on them. Um, so the sleeping bag has got a, you know, usually a comfort rating, which will tell you what sort of temperatures you can go down to and still be, be warm enough to sleep in them. But you lose a lot of heat from the ground as well. So you need a sleeping pad or some sort of mat you know, to, to insulate you from the cold ground. Uh, they, that tends to be measured in um, ATSMR rating or something which is an R value usually the higher the value the colder conditions it'll keep you warm to but that's something that for another video or some research that you might want to do that's all right doing a job starting to drizzle again so back in the tent and we'll talk backpacks so the kind of backpack that I use now is very different to the ones that I started off with um, my first backpacks, like I said, were military Bergens, which are very robust, very tough, but they're also heavy, bulky, and large in volume as well. So, like I said, military stuff is, is quite heavy duty. So you need a big backpack to carry it in. So the first sort of, I'll call it proper backpack that I got was the, I think it was a Van Gogh Contour. It was 50, to 60 litre so um which i think 50 to 60 is like the ideal sort of capacity for for most people to carry most of their stuff there's two rules of thumb <laughs> two different ideas some people say get your backpack last um so you know get the pack that fits all of the other gear for you and others say get your backpack first and then just make sure that you buy gear that it's in your backpack either way um, 50 to 60 will do most scenarios if you've got a, a regular two kilo tent um, some sort of down sleeping bag or some of the more modern synthetics anyway and a sleeping pad that, that isn't too bulky these kind of custom made packs um, are really comfortable lightweight got loads of features on them but about three times the price of some of the off-the-shelf stuff that you can get. So, yeah, it's probably better off starting off with, go and try one on. So that is, um, well, I, the first pack was second-hand, um, the Van Gogh. And so I went, I bought it off Gumtree. So I went round the person's house, tried it on to make sure that it fit me properly. Um, you don't want one that's going to be way too big for you. You know, so the shoulder straps are, are not, you know, they're not even sitting on your shoulders because the torso length is too long. Or the opposite end of the scale, if you get one with a too short a torso length, 
you can feel that it's too tight on your shoulder, so you get shoulder pain. So the, the actual weight of your, your load ideally should be on the hip belt. Um, and the shoulder straps are just there to, to really hold the backpack on your back. The amount of load that these should take is, is quite minimal. I've still got that Van Gogh backpack and it's, I use it <laughs> for my woodland camping. Um, you know, it's, it's had a few little repairs done on it over the years. So the, you know, one of the shoulder straps actually tore a little bit. So I've had to sew that back on. Um, but your backpack is really important because you're going to be carrying weight for sometimes long periods of time over long distances. Just make sure it fits you properly. If you go to some of the reputable shops like Cotswold Outdoors or something like that, they will, they will help you when it comes to fitting a pack. So probably the most common question that I get asked is, which tent should I buy? Um, people want something that is four season that will stand up to the harshest of weather conditions. They want it to weigh <laughs> under a kilo and cost about a hundred pounds. And to be honest with you, you know, you don't get all of those things for <laughs> for a hundred pounds anyway. This tent, for example, is incredibly strong, incredibly robust, but it weighs three and a half kilos, which is too heavy for a lot of people. It's also expensive, around 400, 450 quid. But for a one person tent, this has got quite a lot of room in it. Whereas most one person tents are really tight. So a good rule of thumb is if you want enough room for yourself and your gear, you get a two man tent for one person and you get a three man tent for, for two people. So there's lots of different factors when it comes to choosing a tent. So this is a single skin tent. Um, whereas most people in the UK would use a double skin tent, so you'll get an outer fly made of either nylon or polyester, something like that. And then it's got an inner tent inside, so that helps when it comes to uh, condensation. Let's go out and have a look at some of the features. This is a geodesic, which means that the, the poles cross over in more than one place, which is really good when it comes to being robust in windy conditions. It's also a freestanding tent, which means that if I took all of the pegs out and all of the guy lines, the tent would hold its, its structure exactly the same, unless a big gust of wind came along and you know, blew it across the moors. Other styles of tent may be tunnel tents, where you usually just get a single hoop or two hoops, and then you have to put pegs out to, to make the structure of the tent. You can get semi freestanding tents, which may have a couple of poles that cross over, which will give you a basic structure, but then you still have to guide bits of the tent out to give it its, you know, its full final structure and design. And then the popular one at the moment is trekking pole tents where people are hiking, they're using walking poles or trekking poles and they can utilize them to create the structure of the tent. So these tend to not come with any poles or maybe just a small little pole just to give you that little bit of extra headroom at the end. And then the pole would go maybe up here and it would you know, give you your headroom but it means you're carrying less weight for your shelter if you use trekking or walking poles anyway. So this particular type of freestanding, you know, multi-pole geodesic tent is the sort of tent that I would like to have in really windy conditions when I want belts and braces and I know that my tent is not gonna blow off the hill. They're really, really sturdy. I could probably <laughs> almost sit on that, but I wouldn't want this style of tent if I was like in the Cumbria Way, it's just too heavy. It takes up way too much room in my backpack. So for multi-day treks of maybe 10, 15 miles a day, I'd be using a trekking pole tent, but I use trekking poles anyway, but some other people may not. So they might choose to use a tunnel tent, which only uses maybe one pole, and you can still get them in really lightweight options. There's loads and loads of different things to consider. You know, different pole thicknesses. Some poles are made of um, better quality aluminium, some are made of carbon fibre. The fly on this tent is actually made of polycotton, which is like it's more of a canvas style tent. It is very durable, but it's also thick and heavy. Most of the tents that I use are made from nylon or polyester, but there's lots of variants in that as well when it comes to tear strengths, um, waterproofness. So there's something called a hydrostatic head as well, which is it defines how waterproof your tent is. Anything over 1500 millimeters is considered waterproof, but the higher the figure, the more waterproof it is. So when somebody asks you, what is the best tent for this or the best tent for that? There is actually 
no definitive answer. I've got quite a few different tents that I use for different things. I love them all for different reasons. It is, and they've all got their little flaws as well. So it's gonna be one of those things I'm afraid that when it comes to buying a tent, it might be trial and error. You just need to be wary of the types of style and find one that you think is is going to tick the most boxes for the type of camping that you're going to do. Lightweight doesn't always mean the best. Strongest doesn't always mean the best. Most expensive doesn't always mean the best. I think out of all the bits of gear that you do buy, the tent will be the toughest to decide upon. That's always been the case for me anyway. So you're going to need some sort of warm sleeping kit as well. So I've got a, a down filled sleeping bag here. Down's really good because it compresses really small. But look at this when I take it out. So you can squash this down to virtually nothing. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but you get different ratings of down as well. So usually the higher the number, the better the quality down you've got. You have a comfort rating in um, degrees C and Fahrenheit there. You usually find you can take some of these <laughs> with a bit of a pinch of salt. Usually the more reputable the brand is, the more likely it is to be correct. Although everyone sleeps different. So I usually sleep quite warm. So I can get away with a bag that is not necessarily as rated as warm as it, it needs to be. And then you need to sleep on something as well. If you slept directly on the ground, even with your sleeping bag, all of that down insulation that would keep you warm will be flattened, so it can't do its thing. It works by trapping all of the warm air inside the, the insulation part, so you can get away. This is probably the cheapest way of doing it, is getting some sort of, this is called a closed cell foam mat. So it's basically a squashy sort of foam rubber, which insulates you from the ground. These little dimples also sort of, you know, absorb some of this insulation a little bit which does help a little tiny bit but not a huge amount to be honest with you and this kind of mat for me is is not the most comfortable um, although you know even I've been using some really expensive sleeping pads so this one is the Nemo Tensor I've not actually slept on this so this is going to be the first um, time I've tried it 120 pounds for this inflatable mattress I got it for um, the Thermarest and the new extreme version of this are over £250. I, I can't get incredibly comfortable on it for some reason. So yeah, we're going to give this one a go. And even after all this time, I've still not mastered the sleeping pad. I've not got the perfect one yet. So sleeping pads to me, is one of my biggest bugbears when it comes to spending money. Because you don't seem like you're getting very much for your money at all. Just a little tiny like, air bed. You would think that these are about 10, 15 pounds for what they're made of. But there's quite a lot goes into the technology. This has got some sort of foil liner in there as well. And, and the thing is, you do not know which one is gonna be best for you. It's one of the things you just keep trying. And it's a lot of money to shell out and then it still not be right. So be wary, see if you can borrow one of somebody. We'll go into a shop. I know like some of the big go outdoors have got some set up. Yeah, that's what you get for your money. Just a pocket of air that sounds like a crisp bag when you lie on it. So when it comes to buying things like your sleeping bag or your sleeping pad, just do your research. Um, get uh, stuff that's going to be rated for probably the worst temperatures that you're going to be camping in. And then that should last you all year round. Um, you, know, you don't need to have loads of different stuff for all seasons. However, you know, if you are going to be doing quite varied camping, such as you know, multi-day stuff although you can use the same kit just for, for days like today 
but it might not be ideal if you want to be on Helvellyn in January or something like that. So you know, just make sure that your kit's suitable for the conditions that you're going to be camping in. So just because you're camping doesn't mean that you don't have to eat well. Um, you know, I like to cook things like steak or salmon and having a frying pan with me sometimes. Variety of different stoves. Um, the simplest form of doing it is just having something that's either boiling the bag or the dehydrated meals where you boil some water, add the boiling water to your meal, leave it for 10 minutes and then you get you know, a nice meal. But they can be quite expensive now. Some of them, they range usually from around seven to 10, 12 pounds, some of them. So I have brought with me today paella. And it's from, it's from Aldi. It's one of them good for you sort of ready meals. It was reduced, so I bought it on the reduced day, repackaged it with my vacuum sealer, and then put it in the freezer. And then I took it out earlier on today and it is just about defrosted. And then I'm just gonna boil this in the bag, let it simmer for a while, and then I've got you know a nice tasting meal that is really easy to cook, no washing up really, and you know, I'm just doing it in boiling water. I think it was reduced about 60p. Chicken and king prawn. I'm just gonna redistribute the food a little bit. So I can fold that down. Just check that it fits in the pot. Yep, just about, look. And I'm gonna add some water wherever I put it. There it is. Not quite filled it to the top because when it bubbles and what have you, it's gonna, you know, we don't want it all over your tent area. So I'm gonna bring it to the boil and then I'm just gonna put that little simmering on and let it simmer for a while. So I'm using an alcohol stove and the fuel that I use is bioethanol. Keep it in this little transier bottle. You can just use meths, which is the same thing, but smells a little bit, meths does. And doesn't burn quite as clean. So you might get a little bit of soot on your pot. So I've got this little uh, stove lid there as well, just to protect the grass a little bit. Can just use a sheet of foil or, some, or something like that. And just leave that to do its thing. There we go. leave that to simmer now. With that little simmering the stove lasts for about 40 minutes. Just open that a little bit just to shove some of the food down that was stuck to the side. There's a bit more faff to dinners inside a tent than there is at home but it's worth the effort I think. So that's been simmering away for quite a while now. It is ready to eat. Just snuff this flame out. Right, I am just going to eat this ha, 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 out of the bag. No washing up. Just have to make sure. See, that is the golden rule of wild camping, is that you leave no trace. So that means everything that you bring with you, you take home with you. So you don't leave any rubbish. You don't leave any fire scars. Ah, fire scars. <laughs> Bits of scalded skin. There we go. This is my plate. That's a decent meal when it comes to camping. What did I say again? About 60p. So yeah, batch cook. I mean, do spaghetti bolognese or chili con carne. Vacuum seal it. Boil in the bag. No washing up, just a, a bag to take home. You can, if you make them a little bit bigger like this one. Rinse these out and use them again. Just reseal the top. King prawns on a wild camp. Still no Patrick Dickinson, right? So it's just started raining. 
not too heavy but enough to get you wet I think it's time to shut the patio door it's actually quite warm in here so this is where you start to find out whether your gear is up to the job you know whether your tent's waterproof or you know, later on when you get your head down whether your sleeping equipment is warm enough but you are much better off once you've got your gear rather than just getting straight out there going for the moors or the hills or a mountain have a go on a campsite or have a go on your back garden in similar sort of temperatures just make sure that you know how to use your gear how to pitch your tent properly that your sleeping bag is going to be warm enough your sleeping pad will last the night so it's not going to deflate on you or it's not going to be too cold for you you can practice cooking your meal so you can be confident then when you actually get out wild camping that your gear is going to work as you want it to he says coming out of a sleeping pad for the first time but it's not going to be cold tonight i'm confident that this this is going to be up to the job and i have brought the closed cell foam pad as backup so that's another thing as well Take a little bit more than you need sometimes if you, if you just want to be on the safe side. It doesn't matter if you've got an extra jumper. It doesn't matter if you've got you know, an extra pair of socks or whatever it would be. If that makes you feel comfortable or happy, um, then that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm not one of these that saws me toothbrush in half or you know, drills holes in things just to save a few grams here and there. For me, I'd rather have that little bit more luxury. I get that some people, you know, every gram matters to them, but you know, I'm carrying one of these around, so half a toothbrush is not gonna make a difference, is it really? So I haven't spoken about clothing. So in the UK, the chances are that it is gonna rain at some point. So I do highly recommend you get some kind of waterproof. Um, if you get cold and wet, sometimes it is hard to, to, get, to get warmed up again. So, yeah, good waterproofs, even if it doesn't keep you totally dry inside, it does create that little microclimate, which allows you to, you know, just to stay that little bit warmer. Have some, something dry to change into, dry socks, a dry t-shirt of some description. Um, if you get into your tent wet and you stay in there with wet clothes, you end up with wet sleeping bag and you just never warm up. And hypothermia, although you, know, you wouldn't think that you were getting it here in the UK with our conditions, it is possible and you, know, you want to make sure that you are you know, nice and warm and dry. Got a new toy. I think that's one of my favourite things about wild camping, testing new gear. I don't need any more new gear, but it's always nice to test it out. So this is the Fire Maple Lantern. Gives it a nice little glow. Let me turn some of these other lights off just to see how bright it is. It's quite a nice ambient light, that. The flame does go really high though, look. So you do not want that anywhere near your, your fly sheet. Gives a nice glow, but it gives off a little bit of heat as well. So that is warming my hands up, um, which might also mean it's good for condensation on the tent as well. Condensation. When you get into wild camping, you'll find out what that is. I could quite happily just lay here, watch that flicker, and just listen to that rain all night. I love it. But I need to continue with the video, because now you've got all your gear, let's get some light on. 
blinding. Yeah, so now you've got all your gear and you've tested it out and you know that it holds up to rain <laughs> and your sleeping bag is warm enough. You know, the next bit, I suppose, is trying to find somewhere to go camping. Um, because it, it can be difficult for some people in certain areas. You may need to travel a little bit. So I feel quite lucky that the Peak District, which is where I am now, is at its shortest. It's about 10 minute drive from, from where I live. I can't really camp 10 minutes away. I need to travel a little bit further than that. And then I've got a little bit of a, a hike up as well. So I started off woodland camping. And for most of those camps, it was on somewhere where I had permission to camp. So there are areas like Beehive Bushcraft. Um, there's one in Huddersfield as well. I um, can't remember the name of it now, where there are dedicated bushcrafty come wild camping woodlands that you can just pay a fiver or something just to, to try it out for yourself. Um, however, places like this here, you haven't got to pay a fiver, I suppose, have you? Um, but you have to find these places. Um, I started off on looking on YouTube and on the Facebook groups just for a little bit of inspiration, really. And there's loads of videos on YouTube that actually tell your location so you can see that somebody's already camped there. You know that there's maybe a nice flat pitch to go there. But it's getting really popular now, so... Like some of the spots up on Kinder Scout, you can go on a Saturday and you probably won't get a pitch on some of them because there might be a dozen tents there. I've been on Hallin Fell in the Lake District before where there was around 10, 11 tents, something like that. And it's, it's nice to see people getting out, but you know, I don't want to be camping with, with that many people. So I tend to go midweek now, um, usually when the weather's not great. So this is a Monday night. Um, chucking it down with rain I'm less likely to bump into anybody else or there's less likely to be someone else on this spot so but the best thing I've found the best locations is when you go out and, and explore yourself so go and have a, a recce go for a hike somewhere that's close to you and start and find a few spots you can pin them on your phone um, get your mapping service and get the you know the location and then you know next time there's a suitable spot there. There's also things like Google Maps where you can get street view now, where you can you can also find, I've done a video on it, so I will link it in the description, where you can find spots. Um, you can check the top of the mountain to see if there's any suitable places to pitch. Um, you can find car parking spaces as well. This is without leaving your living room. <laughs> so yeah, it's, there's lots of resources now to be able to find somewhere to get out there. But the, the biggest thing you've got to overcome is just yourself. It's, it's just that having a go. Some people are scared. Um, they're fearful of an axe murderer or <laughs> a werewolf or something like that. I'll put, it, put you out of your misery. There's no werewolves. Um, you are very, very unlikely to find an axe murderer. You're more likely to find one in, on the high street than you are um, coming up to a remote spot on the moors. The further you go, the less likely you are to see people. There are some really popular spots now, um, which you know, I, I wouldn't even go there anymore. Places like Bamford Edge, for example, it's a beautiful location, but there's that many people trying camp there and the, the landowners are not not happy about it to be honest with you so they are sending their gamekeepers or whatever to move you on so if you are lucky enough to not get moved on um, <laughs> then yeah somewhere like that maybe but I wouldn't even attempt it the last thing I want is someone trying to turf me off my pitch at one o'clock in the morning which I know has been done so it yeah, go somewhere a little more remote if you're up on kinder scout somewhere you are going to be fine um, most places in the Lake District, if you go high enough up, um, just don't go camping in a farmer's backyard, basically. Uh, Scotland, different kettle of fish. Um, parts of Dartmoor, different kettle of fish. You're allowed to do it, so um, you haven't got to worry so much. But do your research, plot your route, 
Um, if you can go and have a walk there before, have a get out plan, have a backup plan. Because if somebody's already there, then you know, if you put all your eggs in one basket for one pitch, then you maybe need to find somewhere else. So yeah, it's not difficult. Um, the hardest part is just you know, getting over that, um, that little bit of nerves. Um, fear of getting caught, fear of getting asked to leave, fear of your kit failing. But you, if everything that we're worried about stopped us from doing things, we'd never get out done. So, you know, <laughs> you know just, just do it, just do it, have a go. You won't, you won't regret it. But it's one of them things. I wouldn't just go from an armchair warrior to a wild camp. Um, I would do the other stuff, do the groundwork first, um, do a little bit of hiking, do a little bit of um, camp craft somewhere, on a campsite, things like that. Just to get your fitness up, get your skills level up, um, get to, to know the, the lay of the land, what to expect, different weather conditions, all that kind of stuff. You know, I wouldn't, say, this year I've decided I'm gonna try and learn to swim, I think. <laughs> but I wouldn't try and swim the channel for my first thing. <laughs> I would you know, get in the baby pool with me, I'll bounce on. <laughs> uh, you know, take things gradually. You know, one of them rubber ring things, it needs to be a big one, right? But, <laughs> but you know what I mean, just baby steps and all that. You can barely see your hand in front of your face. Really thick fog today. So if you come wild camping just for the sunsets and the views, sometimes you're going to be disappointed. Pitch black, you can't even see Sheffield. Normally you can see all the lights from here. The only light you can see is a bit from the tent. It's Baltic out there, absolutely freezing. I don't know what the temperature is. I haven't brought my little gadget with me today. If you're coming solo camping, then you've really got to enjoy your own company in the winter. You're spending 12, 14 hours inside the tent. You might need to pop out every now and again for a pee. Um, that's another thing as well. Um, you know, go away from the tracks, go away from your camping areas if you want to go for a wee. If you need to do a number two, <laughs> I try not to to leave myself in that position. It's, um, it's not the most pleasant thing, but I have got a trowel with me um, and I dig a hole. Again, well away from footpaths, well away from camping areas and hole around eight inches deep. Put your mess in. Again, there's two school of thought. Some people bury the toilet paper Others put it in a Ziploc bag and take it home with them. Um, I'll let you do your own research on that one. But you do need to make sure that you dig down a reasonable amount because otherwise animals are going to be digging it up and you know you don't want human waste all over the hills and mountains, do you? You need to make sure as well you've got enough water. So I normally bring around two litres with me. But depending on how long I'm going for or how far the hike is. I bring a water filter with me as well and that way I can always you know, get some water from a stream or even a puddle I've had before. When it's cold outside it's really good for morale to be able to have a brew. Cup of tea, coffee, make sure you remember your milks or whatever and if you have sugar Although I saw a mixed video the other day from Twiggy Escapes. He had to try and make a cuppa with frozen milk. It's just started raining again. Tent's bone dry though. On the inside, not a sniff of condensation. Although I've only been here four and a half, four and a half hours, something like that. But I've cooked and had a couple of brews, so you just got to keep it ventilated. So I've got that little vent open there. And then there's one at either end of the tent as well. 
and when I can I just let a bit of air in through the main door don't know if that's helping at all I forgot to weigh the gas canister next time I'll, I'll measure the, the weight of the canister before and then next day just to, to see how much I've used on an evening so the majority of the wild camping that I do I do on my own and it can be a bit bit daunting for the first time um, it can be a bit daunting any time really that if you hear something outside or um, the weather conditions suddenly turn really bad um, maybe you know if you're a little nervous and there's plenty of groups out there um, Facebook groups things like that where there's people that will happily go wild camping with you obviously do your due diligence and I suggest if you if you're a lady um, for example you know there's there's some weirdos on the internet so don't just go posting out there um, who's going to take me wild camping because you might get some offers that, that you don't really want but yeah there's you know it, there's loads of people that are willing to help you out um, I've got a Facebook group there's wild camping UK there's wildcampinglife.uk um, there's loads of suggested places to go on there as well to, you know, to give you some ideas um, first time around I'd probably go somewhere that isn't too far from your car um, if for any reason you feel the need that you want to tap out it's then just a simple walk back down to the car so maybe a mile two mile tops but not, not too difficult terrain. Something that you could navigate down in the dark with a head torch if you needed to. There's loads of places like that. Go to one of the places like Beehive Bushcraft or something. Um, that way you'll be able to break yourself in a little bit to you know, some of the, the, the noises, for example, that you might hear. You know, I remember once on one of my really early wild camps, it sounded like there was a, I don't know, a wolf or a, you know, a really loud animal out there. It turned out it was just a little beetle crawling up the mesh on the outside of my tent. But there wasn't a breath of wind, it was silent. And that the noise from that little beetle crawling up was... <laughs> it was horrendous at the time, but you get used to these things. I should have really looked at the forecast to see how long it's going to be raining for. Pretty much all night. It drizzles a bit between 3 and 4 a.m. But other than that, it's raining. And in the morning, oh, it stops at 9 o'clock. So with a bit of luck, it'll just be dry enough for me to, to pack away. It's about time for lights out, I think. So tomorrow I'm going to summarise a bit along with a few hints and tips. And I'm going to try and answer the, the last question about what I'd do differently if I was to start wild camping again. Um, obviously that would depend if it was just wild camping from scratch just for wild camping or if I was going to be doing YouTube and whether I wanted to do the bushcraft stuff so we'll see we'll see where that conversation takes us in the morning anyway morning it is a little bit chilly today five degrees Celsius we had a really good downpour last night I was plenty warm enough inside the old feather though. There's no sunrise, but the views are a little bit better than they were last night. Ready for a brew. So there was a tiny little bit of moisture on the bottom of my bag where it was touching the wall of the tent last night. Nothing to worry about though. After about a decade of searching, I think I finally found the comfortable and warm sleeping pad. Which leads me into a few tips really. Um, just because something works really well for somebody else doesn't mean that it'll work well for you. Um, you might find the sleeping pad uncomfortable. Um, you might really like laying on a closed cell phone mat. It's, 
it's all about personal preference. We're all very different when it comes to gear. Same with, with backpacks. You might find one more comfortable than the other. You might find a tent suits your needs better. Uh, you might prefer a quilt over a sleeping bag. It's There's so many different variables out there. So all you can do is is try and research the kit that is most likely going to be suitable for your needs. Um, but you know, don't be worried too much if if it doesn't work out. <laughs> There's plenty of other stuff to try, but but it can get expensive. So I get that you want to try and get it right first time. So back in the day, camping used to be a, a cheap holiday. <laughs> but you know, some of this wild camping gear can be quite expensive. Um, I'll give you another little tip. So a tent that you can get for around 80 pounds, 100 pounds, will have done exactly the same job as this tent did last night. It would have kept me, me dry, it would have kept me warm. Um, however, this tent may be able to do things that the 100 pound tent can't do. So it will stand up to 50 mile an hour winds up on a mountain top, whereas, you know, your 100 pound tent may be pushing it a little. You could buy a backpack off Amazon for about 30, 40 pound that will carry all of your stuff, the same as this one did. It might not be as comfortable, it might be heavier, might not have as many features, but you know it will do the job for you. You don't have to have the most expensive gear. And it's, to be honest with you, um, I've said it before in other videos that I've never ever replicated that feeling that I got on my first ever wild camp and that was with you know, real budget gear you know, the the buzz that you get out of it first time is is different to all of the others so it's the experience that you get and what's out there that makes the trip the gear is just a tool to get you through it really not the same as real milk but it will do a job another gear tip you don't have to buy it brand new um there's loads of places where you can buy really good quality, lightly used gear, you know, a, a fraction of the price of the new price and it'll still have many years left in it. So you can, places like eBay, obviously, you've got the Outdoor Gear Exchange on Facebook. So there's lots of Facebook groups, Gumtree. So I bought my first rucksack on Gumtree. Um, first proper rucksack anyway the military one i got from you know the local army stores but it, there are lots of places out there where you can get gear that isn't too expensive there's also loads of little companies that make cheap sort of custom things like this i think that was about 30 pound for that complete stove set you can't get that one anymore but speeds to stoves is another one that does you know a similar sort of thing I keep hearing stories of people going in charity shops and finding Terra Nova tents and Hilleberg tents. I don't believe all of them, right? But, you know, you never know. Go and check them out. So it's taken me quite a while to actually get a spot like this that I can come to that's literally 15 minutes from home and then a short walk. It means a lot having a place that I can just come to at really short notice. And if I get a nice window of opportunity... Sometimes I need to get out just for, to sort my head out really. So that's another thing that you really should think about is what do you actually want to do wild camping for? If Is it just a, to get a nice picture for Instagram? Or is it you know, to make YouTube videos? I don't know what it is you want to do it for. Um, the real reason for me to to get out camping is my head just, when I'm at home, if I'm there for too long, I get like cabin fever or whatever it is. And Joe says, you need to get out. In fact, last night was, you need to go. We have stuff to do at the minute. But Joe can tell when I'm due a bit of outdoor therapy. And having somewhere really close like this means that I can do that easily. Although this isn't technically <laughs> my spot. So, you know, this is somebody else's place for doing that. And after a little bit of investigation, I've, I found out where it was. So... Um, I think it's quite a few people come here now. Go check out YouTube or the wild camping forums on Facebook and Reddit and what have you. 
and there'll be loads of inspiration of places that you can go but just go out and explore a little bit for the day and see what places you come across um, one thing I would rather walk a little bit further and park my car in a village rather than just leaving it on a lay-by or by itself. I've never had any problems wherever I've parked like, but yeah, it's just each their own. If you're happy that your car's insured, <laughs> then that's fine. But you know, I've heard of odd cases where even in villages to be fair, but where people have had the windows put through when they come back or a tire slashed. I try not to worry about it. Just try not to make your car an easy target, shall we say. So I haven't spoke about the huge elephant in the room. Is it okay to go wild camping? Is it legal? <laughs> Depends where you are, that's all I'm gonna say. There's quite a few people, including myself, that's made a full video on this. I will put links to a couple down below, including one from an actual barrister, um, Daniel, the uh, black belt barrister, has done a really good video explaining all the ins and outs. So before I show you how I've packed my sleeping bag in a vacuum bag, I suppose I better ask that question about would I do anything differently? Ooh, it's still a really tough question. So overall I wouldn't do anything differently at all because the choices that I've made, the videos that I've made showing the gear that I've bought, going to the places that I've been to, has somehow created this wonderful life for me where you know, I could have only dreamt of doing YouTube anyway as a, as a job. 10 years ago, yeah, I was resigned to being in the factory for the rest of my life, but so you know, I can't change anything. However, if I was just starting from scratch again and I had no plans to go into YouTube or anything like that, or I had no plans Although I do recommend you having a go at YouTube. <laughs> you never know. And it's good just for, for sharing your experiences with other people. Um, yeah, if I had to start from scratch, and it was purely this style of wild camping, you know, I wasn't doing the bushcraft stuff, then yeah, I would do things a little bit differently. Um, I would... <laughs> I'd have bought a Nemo Tensor sleeping pad right from the start <laughs> um, although I've only used it once it might pack up on me in the next on the next camp you never know dear I wouldn't have anywhere near as much gear I'd probably have two sets so one for winter slash mountain camping which may be a tent something like this one freestanding free really strong durable four season and, and capable of of camping all year round and then I would probably have a a trekking pole tent something like my Durston X mid then for the other type of camping so if I wanted to do long distance hikes um, or you know just quick pitch in nice weather really and that's the perfect shelter for those kind of things perfect for, for when I did the Cumbria way um, I, I can't think of a, a shelter that would have done any better for me than that. Again, I'd probably have um, one warm sleeping bag, like that one there, the Rab one that I've got, and I'd have one lighter weight quilt for the summer months, autumn months, everything that doesn't require a really warm bag. I'd only need the one rucksack, really, something like that, um, Atom Packs. 60 litre. I can roll it down to the same size as my 50 litre one, so it's it's not really any bigger, but it just gives me more options. So it's not too big that I can't use it in the warmer months, but then when I want to shove a little bit extra in, maybe a, another jumper or something in the in winter, then I've got something that would do that. I think I would still have a number of different cook kits. I love the variety of them, and I, I do different styles of cooking. Um, you know, sometimes it's steak in a, in a skillet or frying pan. Sometimes it's a boil in the bag. Sometimes it's a dehydrated meal. And you know, some of that kit is quite bulky. But, yeah, I probably have still a handful of stoves. 
can't help myself really. And the rest is just gadgets and clothes and stuff. They're the kind of things that you're changing all the time anyway. I would definitely skip the buy cheap option. Um, you know, like your 30 pound air mattresses and stuff like that, because they're not gonna last very long. They're not gonna be warm enough. Um, they do a job at the time, but you ultimately you're gonna get <laughs> something better anyway. Um, I would rather instead just use the little foam mat for a while. I've had that one years. There's nothing to go wrong with them. They're not the most comfortable, but you can use them just to supplement your other gear. You can use it to protect your other gear from the ground. It's, it's a really handy bit of kit to have anyway. That Overall, I've really enjoyed the whole process of you know, honing in my skills and learning to do things better, to do things differently. Using a bit of common sense or having that little bit of extra knowledge can sometimes allow you to get away with lesser kit. So, you know, this tent, for example, will will stand strong um, on the summit of a mountain in, in really high winds. But if I was using the 100 pound tent that I mentioned earlier, common sense tells you not to pitch it in a windy, exposed area. You're much safer pitching it sheltered behind some rocks, um, lower down, um, you know, usually the higher you go, the windier it gets. So overall, I wouldn't have it any other way, really. Anyway, you want to see me suck the air out of this bag, don't you? So there's my pump, the flex tail. I can use that to inflate my air mattress, as well as, you know, um, deflate, or should we say, <coughs> shrink my sleeping bag and down jacket and things into one of these kind of vacuum sealer bags. You must have used these when you've been on holiday before, when you're trying to get your budgie smugglers into your suitcase. Yeah, so just get the, the bag, shove it in. So left uncompressed, that would actually fill my rucksack. And shove it down a fair amount. And then there's like a little plastic thing that you can seal the bag with. And just unscrew this little cap. You can actually just push the air out. Make sure your, your pump goes both ways. So this way blows your sleeping pad up. This way you know, deflates things or creates a vacuum. Turn it on. Horrible noise, I'm afraid. Trying to shape it a little bit so it same shape as my rucksack. Turn it off, pull that off, and then just screw the cap on. There we go. Much smaller package there. Gives you loads of room for everything else now. Just a couple more things to add, really. First one, the golden rule, whether you are just here for the day, whether you're just hiking, whether you're camping overnight, you leave no trace. You take everything home with you. Even your banana skins, they take months to decompose. Just take them home, put them in the bin. There should really be no evidence that you've ever been here other than maybe a little bit of flat grass the odd footprint in the mud. This is the last tip, I promise. So if you're on the fence and you're thinking about giving wild camping a go, just go out and do it. Be brave, pluck up the courage. 
you might just fall in love with it. If you're not sure about wild camping, just go out for a hike, go and explore. You never know where it leads. This is my back garden now. I've claimed it on certain days. So I've come out because I was suffering from that bit of cabin fever in the house. And now, although my eyes might not back it up, <laughs> I'm recharged, I'm refreshed. Even if I've not slept a, you know, a wink of sleep on a really windy night, I still come back buzzing. So if you've got any more questions, just drop them in the comments and I'll try and answer some of them in future videos. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.